Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 199 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. You're watching the Stargate Oral History Project. And I um, am thrilled because I am here with the people who bring you uh, this show week in and a week out here. Uh, and I am so, and a cat, apparently. Um, and I. <laughs> I am I am so privileged uh, to be able to uh, share this space with them today. They are the ones who make this show happen. Say hello, everybody. Hello, hello. everybody. Hello. And Gary Jones, my dear friend, sir, Walter Harriman in Stargate, and and all decked out as Walter today. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, for for taking this journey with me as a co-host in various episodes uh, i it, it just seems you know it it seemed appropriate to have you back here on the cusp of our 200th uh to celebrate uh the journey that has been gathering these stories uh these stargate stories over the past you know two and a half years wow yeah thank you for having me it's great i mean any chance to to uh to see if I still fit into this flight suit is uh, <laughs> it's great, and I and I do. So that's something. After God, how many years? Yeah, you know. What have you been up to? Have you been working on any more art? What's going on in your world? I have been working on some more art. Um, uh, if you like, I can show you my uh, latest painting. Please, please. Yeah, would you guys like to see that? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me just let me just uh, fix the <clears throat> the background. Uh, no. Okay. There you go. Um, hang tight. One second. I'll just put this over here, and I'll bring the painting around. And I'm still. Uh, it's it's a it's a work in progress, but um, it was a picture that I took. Uh, a photograph that I took in uh, Mexico when I was uh, down at the beach. And I thought, oh, this is a hilarious photo. Anyway, it's a pretty big canvas, so I don't know if you can... Let me just push this back to get it all in. Anyway, uh, let me see. So this, I'll show you, this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. Whoa, look at that. Yeah. So I'm pretty uh not pretty wow. happy with it so far. The and waves. Because it's, uh, because it's kind of uh water, you know, uh water based in terms of the in terms of the theme. Yeah. Um, then uh I'm going to hang it in my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hanging in my bathroom. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah here. Yeah. That, and it runs in the family. Is your, is your son still, uh, is your son still painting? He hasn't been painting. Uh, he, well, he, no, the, the short answer is no. Okay. But um, <clears throat> he texted me the other day, actually, to say, to tell me that there was a painting that he'd started working on, which I was like, I was like, seriously, like you, you're going to try and paint that. And he, he's, he's in the process. He's about halfway through it. And it's, um, it's a, it's a picture of, um, it's a painting of, uh, led the group Led Zeppelin oh. singing and it's really good. And I'll just show you, uh, uh, since David brought it up, yes. wh why David is referencing, um, <clears throat> my son's painting, because I didn't know until he started doing it, that my son could actually paint. I had no idea. He'd never really done it. He started sort of drawing and, and I was like, well, he's, he's pretty good. Like, but, and then he, and then he tried one or two paintings. And then this, what I'll show you is, is his uh, third painting. Check this out. Mm -hmm. I love this. We've had this one on the this, show before. This, it's amazing. Uh, this kind of blew my mind when. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh wow. That. Yeah. Look at that. Look at nice. That. That's These amazing. Things. The reflection is amazing. Yeah. yeah, it looks like a photograph. Yeah, yeah. it's people, photorealistic. People, people yeah. thought it was a photograph, 
And I said, no, that my son painted that. And people are like, just completely shocked. Yeah. Had no idea. Well, neither did I really. Like he just, uh, he just did it. And uh, I was, and when he did it, I said, okay. And he had, he, he was painting it at the, at my house and i said and when he finished i said that's not leaving here that's <laughs> so i'm really uh amazed at that i love i look at it you know in my, it's in, it's hanging on my living room wall and i look at it all the time so he's um <clears throat> he's he's really good gary are you are you still doing commissions oh yeah yeah i would i i mean i i haven't uh i haven't been asked to do a commission but i but i have done them i, okay. I yeah I did okay. one for I think I told you, David, that I a lady contacted mm -hmm. me through Twitter, a lady in the in the States, and she asked me to do a a, a portrait of her father in law. And I was like, mm, yeah, OK, sure. And she sent me. Oh, God, it had to be the worst photograph of this guy. It looked like it looked like a, a reject from a um, uh, from like a passport uh, photo, you know, attempt. You know, he was just like this guy just staring off, but I did it anyway. And I, I, it was, a, it was really cool. I was really glad I did it. Actually. It was a, it was a, it was quite a challenge. I think that's the one that but, you, you had on with us where the lens uh, from yeah. his glasses. Where yeah. That's yeah. the thing that attracted it to me. His face was kind of like this. And it turns out that he had quite thick, um, thick glasses. And it, what it did was it sort of like, curve the like you know you know the way if you have really thick glasses it sort of brings your face in sometimes um depending on the severity of your of uh you know your, your how bad your eyes are and <clears throat> that's the thing that caught that 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 i looked at and i because you know i just i look for these various things to that catch my eye and make and inspire me to do it so that's the thing and and anyway <clears throat> so i did this painting and shipped it off to her and she loved it. And she, she sent me a picture of it hanging on her wall and her, and her father-in-law was like, so impressed ah. that he couldn't believe that somebody had actually gone to the trouble to, to um, uh, make a painting of him, a portrait. So I, that was pretty cool. Yeah. So, so yes, I still do uh, commissions. All right. So keep that in mind, folks, you can reach out to Gary over Twitter or message me at dial the gate show at gmail.com. The, the show's email, uh, if you're uh, interested in yeah, but just know going. that this is this is not a this this was not a plug for no me. this this is my request Art. so this no. is David uh, being my uh, my uh, my art gallery representative. <laughs> I could dream, can I? <laughs> That's funny, Gary. Would you mind going around the uh, the circle here and uh, asking people about? Uh, uh, what their what their Stargate stories are? We we know Summers. Summer may be able to amend that with uh, a lot of uh, the more recent uh, uh, stuff that she's done with Dial the Gate. But I'm I'm interested in knowing everyone's Stargate story through Gary through your lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, why don't we start? I'm just looking at the, my screen here. So to the right of me is uh, is uh, Jeremy. So Jeremy, why don't why don't you start? Because you, you sure. look like you've got the super official headset on. <laughs> and, well, it's uh, nice to virtually meet you, Gary. Um, man, Stargate for me, as all thanks to my dad, he had seasons one through eight on DVD, and I just watched them nonstop when I was a kid. Yeah. And then I discovered Gate World, and uh, Darren and David were part of Gate World back then, and you know, I followed Gate World religiously and when david started dial the gate i just asked if he needed a moderator because i'd love to i don't know be on a stargate show because stargate is one of my favorite sci-fi shows and i love i love the ships in stargate i love space battles uh obviously the characters and all that so yeah that's kind of my brief story nice that's great well um lovely to meet you and thanks, you thanks for being here yeah thank you um just uh just a quick aside you mentioned the the spaceships and uh you know i was lucky enough in one episode to drive an alcash yeah and um my memory of that was when i first got you know when i first saw the script and i saw and i saw that i'd be driving an alcash uh, I was really excited and I was like, oh, this is going to be so cool because it was like out of the office. 
and it was out of my chair that I'd been stuck to for like nine years. And, um, but, and it was directed by my good friend, Andy Makita. But when I uh, got there, the reality of it was, you know, you're sitting in this giant prop that they've made and it's just in a sound stage. It just, it just reads way better on the page, you know, like it actually exists. And uh, so you get in it and it's all wood and plywood and spray painted and everything. And, and when I got, when I sat into the chair to drive it, I was like, Andy, how do I know how to drive this thing? Like you got me flying this Alcash, like, when how how do I know how do I know how to do that? And Andy's response was, "Yeah, you just do." <laughs> Prometheus that Unbound was, was the episode, and yeah, eight years <laughs> in, you know, I suspect you got some training on the side somewhere. Yeah, where? Yeah, where? You know, he just goes, "Oh, you just do," and that was that was from the that was from the director, you know, essentially not wanting to. Um, uh, waste any time um uh saying uh oh yeah right they, they, there's zero backstory like zero backstory you know you just get in and you drive and i started joking i go oh what is the are the instructions in the glove compartment here and they you know <laughs> and when i was flying it i had to be like firing you know missiles and whatever pretending to do that and honestly what i was staring at Right ahead of me was a, was a teamster leaning against a wall eating a donut. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally my target. Yeah, <laughs> teamster tar teamster target locked in. You know, fire. You know, and I was just pretending I was uh, killing a teamster, and he wouldn't die. <laughs> and, he was just, and and the, and the teamsters are hilarious because when they're on set, they are so. They could care less about anything. They're so bored and they're just standing around making so much money. And if you go out to the parking lot and talk to them or, or walk past them, they're, they're either talking about two things, two things. One is directions, okay, of how to get to a certain location, directions, what highway to take. What highway did you take? Oh, I took the the, the highway. Oh, you shouldn't have, you should have cut off at highway, blah, blah, and taken the other thing. And they just argue about directions, about who knows how to get somewhere faster. So that's that. And then the other thing is all the stuff they bought, like the boats and the quads <laughs> and the, you know, and the toys that they have. Because they're like, they have so much money. They just buy shit. And that's what they all talk about, you know? So anyway. Anyway, uh, uh, Jeremy, I hope that uh, you know. That's awesome. Give you, little, give you a little insight into into what it was like in my own personal, um, uh, you know, uh, connection to right to the uh, spaceship. Okay, so now summer, go summer and go. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, first of all, Gary, I thank you. I can't believe I'm saying that this is like the third or fourth time I've been interviewed by you. So that's amazing to me. Um, it blows my mind how much a part of the Stargate family that uh, I've become in the past, you know, four years or so. And um, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, I, a quick background. I know most of a lot of people on Dial the Gate know my story, but I have a lot of medical issues, a lot of surgery. And so the joke or the kind of thing that I like to say is Stargate is my medication. Um when I've had surgery before and it was noticed by one of the doctors and nurses one time after one of my surgeries, my blood pressure would um, go dangerously high. And but when Stargate would come on on the TV in the hospital room, my blood pressure would go down. So my doctor and the nurses, they started noticing this and was joking. And the doctor jokingly wrote me a prescription for Stargate every day. So oh uh, <laughs> I would watch Stargate every day and my blood pressure would go back to normal. Oh, so wow. That's I love Stargate. I share it with my friends and my family. It's just a bonding experience for me. It's um, it's it's a healing experience for me. I, I love every aspect of the show. And uh, when... David went to start 
uh, Dial the Gate. I was like, oh, I want to be a part of that. May I be a part of that? Do you need anyone? And he's like, sure, come on board and, you know, we'll find something for you to do. And so I've been helping moderate and uh, helping out with various things about the show. And it's just been absolutely lovely. I've been able to meet so many wonderful people, um, so many people behind the scenes, uh, in front of the camera, um, so many people who played the part, played parts in the show that we don't even think about. And yeah. it's just really wonderful to see all the behind the scenes and all the little aspects of the show. And of course, to meet everybody, all of our, all of the Stargate fandom, all of the fans that have gathered around Dial the Gate and made it what it is. And um, I'm just, I'm blessed. I'm I'm so excited to be here. And uh, I hope that our journey continues a long time. Like uh, we were talking about before the show, this uh, Stargate doesn't die. And I don't think there, there's a lot of people out there determined not to let it die. So um, I hope it continues for a long time. <laughs> Oh, nice. And I noticed that, I, you know, while you were talking, um, uh, I checked my own blood pressure and uh, it turns out it's SG over 120. So it's good. <laughs> it's good. <No>. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just don't OD on the show. You know what I mean? I'll so, try. It's really hard. It's yeah. really hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you, Summer. It's great mm -hmm. to see you again, and uh, you love too. to hear your your voice and hear what you have to say. Thank Anthony, you. Uh, what's going on? You're uh, you're in the middle of a forest uh, with just a shirt on. You must be freezing. It's the northern lights. Yes. Yes. Thank you for being here today. It's fantastic to see you. Thank you. It's an honor to meet you. Genuinely, um, I found stargate purely by accident um my wife had started a job several miles away um and <clears throat> i had to drive her there and decided to stay for the day and i had a, a portable dvd player um and i found a, a little market um and i went and bought one i, I was looking for a, a, a series of some sort um, and I went and bought um, disc number two of the weekly um, Stargate collection, the magazine collection that they did, um, which was The Enemy Within, um, Emancipation and the Broker Divide. Um, I, I watched that and I went back and got disc number three and then number four. Um, and I eventually I cleared him out up to the end of season six which is all he had um and then it was on to the box sets and atlantis and universe from there mm. um i spend quite a lot of time watching stargate mm. a, a, a carif, my wife she has all sorts of, of medical needs um so i spend a lot of time at home with my own thoughts um, and Stargate is is a release. For me. Um, so yeah, it's um that that that's my story. I love that you stumbled upon it in some outdoor market. That just kills me. It, it was completely accidental. I just wanted something that I knew I could sit down and watch for for four or five days in a row with <laughs> with my wife being at work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it happened to be Stargate that I picked up. Wow, cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for that the the that uh, happy accident. That's great. Wonderful. It certainly was. Yeah. Yeah. And where are you now? Where are you living right now? Um, I'm in Cornwall in the UK. Okay. I was I yeah. was just in the UK. Um. I hosted a convention in Basingstoke, just outside of London. It's about an hour southwest of London. And I got brought over to host it for the weekend. And there were, who was there? Um, Paul McGillian, Joe Flanagan, uh, some, uh, oh God, 
uh, Rachel was there. Rachel, um, Rachel uh, Latrell was there too. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, and on the on the uh, so I was I was hosting it from Friday to Sunday, and then on the Sunday, uh, David Tennant uh, showed up. Wow, and that wow. was that was pretty cool because. I had been when they invite the uh, the woman who organized the Basingstoke Con, uh, Jane Lowther. She had actually seen me host a weekend in Chicago at the um, Creation Con, and so when she was putting this on and she decided that she needed a host, she thought of me and I was pretty honored. And she said, "You know, would you host it?" And I was like, "Yeah," in a heartbeat. Like I like doing. I like doing more than simply appearing at a at a convention rather than just getting on stage and you know i, I like um I, what what that's good for me is is that it I, I get to meet the other actors i get to kind of improvise and have fun and it kind of draws upon my comedic background so i love that so she had said to me you know really all i need you to do is just kind of uh, bring people on and off and just have some fun and I was like yeah in a heartbeat so so anyway on on the day that uh, that uh, on Sunday afternoon when David Tennant shows up he was there with his manager and his manager is backstage and so they said okay you ready to introduce David and I said yeah so I gave I went on gave a funny little intro and then I, and then he I called him on and he comes bounding on and the place goes crazy as you can imagine. And I just uh, walked backstage and his manager comes running at me. He's like, what are you doing? Good though. You get back up there. And I was like, what? Why? And he goes, well, because he needs, you need to moderate questions. And I said, well, I, he seems to be doing fine. They're loving him. Like he can do no wrong kind of thing. You don't really need me there, you know, which is, you know, we usually hear that from actors, you know, most actors are like, oh yeah. Okay. And I was like trying to talk myself, uh, talk myself out of being on stage with him. And his manager was like insistent. He goes, get up there. And he hands me a microphone, sticks it in my face. And I go, OK. So now I by the time that happened, uh, David Tennant had already sat down and was kind of like saying hello. And then I come on. And I, it's like, oh my God, I hate this. And I kind of sat down beside him and he looks over and he goes, oh, hello, you know, and, and in his Scottish accent or whatever. And, uh, and I thought, am I just going to sit here like a lump, you know, because they're, they're just, you know, they're there to see him. Right. It's like, what's Gary, what's he doing here? Um, you know, trying to poach on his on his celebrity or something. So I sat there for a second. And then the next thing I know, David is including me in the conversation. Guy was like so generous and so lovely. Very funny, very funny, super quick, um, generous, uh, love the fans. And uh, uh and at one point he just turned to me, you know, they asked him about acting or something about acting. And 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 uh, he he mentioned he gave some answer or whatever and then he turned to me and he said would would you say so Gary like what like what do you think and I was like oh, okay this is great now I can I, he's actually he's actually leveling the playing field and uh, and and he's more concerned with kind of like the greater good of the interview rather than him trying to be you know Mister Man of the Moment kind of thing so I thought oh that's so great. And I, you know, I mean, I think I, I think I would be like that too, but I definitely took a, a page out of his book and I thought, man, if I'm ever on stage like that in that capacity and somebody comes on, I, it's, it was, he was very inclusive and, and everything. And, and then we started to really have uh, a lot of fun. Um, and at one point, at one point, you know, they would bring the microphones around to the audience members and, uh, and, um, get them to ask a question and so she's over she's sort of over in that direction like a, like sort of diagonal to us she's looking over generally at us and uh she gets the she gets the microphone and she goes she goes well hello dr gorgeous right that's how she started <laughs> her you know she goes, hello <laughs> dr gorgeous and before anybody could say anything i just jumped in i said excuse me I would ask that you direct all questions and comments to David Tennant. 
<laughs> That's awesome. That was great. That is great. And and that and he just killed himself laughing, and it kind of yeah. brought the house down. And uh, and then I just like you know didn't make a big deal out of it. Just like, but those are the the I love those moments, mm -hmm. you know. And it's you know it's what I it's what I was trained to do, like uh, improvising and just seize the moment and. and you know, if you wait a second too long, if I had waited even half a second, David Tennant uh, could have started talking and then I would have been interrupting him uh, just to get a joke in. So it like it, what I loved about that moment is it was just so clean yeah. and, you know, it worked. So that was pretty fun. Anyway, uh, great. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Frederick Marcou. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, man. Where? What's your deal? What's your deal? And why do you? Why do you need uh, such giant uh, headsets? Like what? Well, those are just headphones. It's not even a headset with microphone. Wow. They had a microphone just... here. Oh my god. <laughs> Good lord. Are yeah, you shrinking? Yeah. Uh, maybe. I don't know. But All right, yeah. Go. So. My, my story is pretty basic. I mean, I started watching the show really young with my dad. Uh, he watched it in English. I'm a French Canadian back in, in Montreal. Oh, so, yeah. So uh, I watched it in English first with my dad. Didn't understand a thing. So he had to answer all of my questions until we got a translated version in French. And I started watching it on my home. And Eventually, I just went from SG-1 to Atlantis to Universe and then converted half of my friends to Gators and also converted my girlfriend to a Stargate Universe lover. So right. that's pretty much my story. I just use Stargate as the only sci-fi show that I actually really like and can rewatch a thousand times all over again. Because oh I tried God. that with Star Trek. I, start, I tried that with Star Wars and I, I just can't. It's not the same. Mm. So Stargate is part of me just because I watched it from so young. It's just, yeah, it is me now. What well, it is you? Yeah, I'm like a merge between O'Neill, uh, Jackson, and then Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've said a lot of things that that are very familiar to me. I hear it all the time, and specifically one thing you said, like you watched it with your dad, and um, uh, so many fans younger fans uh have watched it with their parents and uh that's i think one of the reasons why it's become like the cockroach of sci-fi <laughs> it's that it just continues on it just gets passed along um because parents watch it then the kids get into it and uh and then i meet the mums and the dads and the kids at conventions so it's multi-generational and this like shows no sign of slowing down because it's like another entire generation that that loves the show as much as their parents you know um so and i'm 27 so once i get kids they'll be watching it too yeah yeah no it's it, it this is not unfamiliar to me i hear it all the time and um uh and one of you know just to sort of just mention summer again like i've heard a lot like i had a i've had a lot of fans come to my table when i'm at various conventions and they talk about how stargate kind of got them through difficult uh you know health issues or dif difficult periods in their lives and i don't know what this like how can you how do you so respond to that? Yeah, if it's if it's such a, a life altering event for them, you know, it's like anything that you have to say in comparison is can't it, can't it, affect it, that. It, like that's the one thing yeah. you ne like I would have never expected to hear. Yeah. I had no idea, um, but obviously it's a testament to uh, to the fact that uh, you know I've always I've always talked about the chemistry, the alchemy of the of the leads. Uh, and, you know, you got to remember, you got to think, think back after watching, say, 10 seasons of Stargate. But you got to know that when they auditioned those guys, they didn't know, you know, they just kind of everybody, every all producers just it's always a shot in the dark. They have no idea uh, how that actor that they've chosen is going to kind of pan out in the bigger picture. They just don't know, you know, so 
just it's something to think about when you're watching the show, especially in the later seasons, to go, what must that have been like when they auditioned them? Because they were all good actors and the and the and the um producers like Brad and Jonathan and all those guys would have gone, mm, yeah, there's like I like this person, you know. But that's all you have to go by, whether they can act and if they sort of fit what they what they had in mind. Beyond that, like if they didn't, if you didn't have that alchemy, you you would have you, what you would have seen was replacements. They mm -hmm. would you you know you would have seen this a certain character along the way, and if somebody didn't fit into the into the foursome, they would have been they would have changed them. In other words, a, an example would have been like this: like if they had hired not Chris Judge, let's say as an example, let's say they wanted this this. Uh, this character, this alien character. And if Chris just wasn't cutting it for them, they would have then found a way to kill Chris's character or get rid of him and then bring in somebody else because they were like, it's not working. So they're trying to get something that works. But at the beginning, they have no idea. And they didn't really know with me either because my audition, I turned into like a comedy bit because when I auditioned, I did not know what the tone of the show was. I didn't know if it was, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know what a Chevron was. I had <laughs> no idea what, when I was reading my audition sides, I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what I was referencing. I just was saying Chevron one encoded. And I'm thinking, where the hell is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Something's encoded. Something's lit up. I don't know. You know. And I just kept saying it to try and maybe sound like I knew what I was talking about. But I did it in because I didn't know I did it in a comedic way. And it made uh, Brad and those guys and Michael Greenberg laugh. And I got hired not because um, I don't think it was because I was anything particularly special or like, oh, my God, there's our technician. I don't think it was like that at all. They told me later, they said you were the only guy who did anything with it? Because when you're just reading chevrons, it's like mm -hmm. you're reading a grocery list. So everybody else who came in prior to me were, were they they just read it like that. And I was the only one who did something with it. And it made them laugh and they remembered and they were like, okay, bring this. So when I came back from my callback, I did what every actor does. You 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 know, you're waiting in the hallway and I say to the assistant, okay, who else is called back for this? Who am, who am I up against? Because back you know back then i would i would know all, a lot of the actors we'd go up for the same roles so if they called somebody else in i'd be like oh okay and he goes no just you just you you're the only one called back it's like wow and then i got the part so that is you know it was meant to be but uh just relating it back to the whole alchemy of of the of the show and then the writing um because there's such good writers and you know the you chemistry was was great if i may like yeah it it felt and that's one reason i think a lot of people are drawn to it because the chemistry it makes it feel like family makes it feel yeah. like cohesive and it makes the the writers and the actors make you feel a part of that family and like you you're a constant on the show and it's not a it's not stargate without walter you know and it's here here it's it it's definitely something that we all it, get really comfortable with and it's familiar and oh, we go so to that. Nice. And so I know for me personally, um, for me, it wasn't, Oh, I'm meeting superstars or whatever. For me, it was along the medical lines or in along the comfort lines is just to be able to say, thank you. That is huge for me to be able right. to tell everybody a part of the show. Thank you because of right. how much it mattered to to me to a lot of other people uh in the community so yeah you're definitely right it's it has that everything that it needed to to make that uh chemistry work great great linda what's going on oh um life in general um <laughs> summer I gotta school my, yeah <laughs> summer school <laughs> almost done we got got this week and then i'm i'm done um, I've been doing pottery with the kids this summer, mm. uh, and that's been really fun. Uh, we actually got a wheel in to for them to use, and I've oh, cool. gotten them all on the wheel once. And, uh, my hands are really sore from doing pottery every day. <laughs> Linda, what's your Stargate story? My Stargate story. I don't think story... I've asked it on the show. Um, 
Um, I think I've told it before, but it would have been a really, really long time ago, like way back near the beginning. Um, I saw um, Starlog magazine. I, I used to to get it every month. I'd, I'd go to the, the mall to the newsstand and pick it up. And um, it had this Earth 2 article on the cover. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, that's cool, because I, I was enjoying that. And I'm like thumbing through and there's this two page spread on Stargate the movie. And it was showing a lot of the costumes like the Jaffa and the Anubis costume. And it had all this Egyptian stuff in the background and was going on about how they used, um, you know, like like really huge crowd scenes like Lawrence Arabia. And and I was like, I was hooked. I was like, this looks incredible. I have to go see this movie. Um, so right. I did. And then I did again and again and probably again and again. Um, and it was actually the first DVD I ever bought um, when it when it came out on DVD. I, I immediately ran out and snapped it up. Um, and when the the series came on and I saw Richard Dean Anderson was going to be in it, uh, being a rabid MacGyver fan, I was I was hooked before it even aired. So um, I guess my my story all along is hooked before I even saw any of it. Uh, and I've continued to be hooked ever since. So oh, guess cool. you guys did something right. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Richard, uh, Rick, Rick, certainly with MacGyver and Stargate. Boy, did that guy ever hit the jackpot. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, who gets that sort of career? <laughs> he could have retired after MacGyver. And then he's on Stargate. It's like, holy Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Hook before you even saw it. I love it. Yeah. That's great. That's how we like our fans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tracy, what's going on with you? Well, it's nice to see you again. Um, I've been a fan of Stargate for, oh my gosh, ever since the movie, like Linda. Um, it was really fascinating. And again, like Linda, um, I was little watching MacGyver. And then when Stargate came on, I was like, oh my gosh, it's MacGyver. I can't wait. Um, and I started watching it back when it was airing and then, you know, life kind of happens with family and work obligations. So I kind of got away from it a little bit and just back in March of 2020, um, things kind of went a little bit sideways and I was working a lot of hours and needed a little bit of downtime. So, you know, you get out your phone and you start scrolling and I start looking up actors <laughs> and shows that I used to watch, you know, a long time ago and, Richard Dean Anderson and Stargate popped up and you know then you go down the rabbit hole and you start watching everything again and of course the more I interacted with like Stargate content the more notifications I was getting with Google and Google sent me a notification telling me about the launch of a new channel on YouTube and I was like okay so I checked it out it hadn't aired yet and lo and behold it was dial the gate I clicked the subscribe button, the bell notification, and then I got the notice and boom, there was the first episode of Dial the Gate. And um, I didn't know you that, were with us from day one. I never knew me that. Me neither. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, David, I think I was one of the first 50 subscribers to the wow. channel. Wow. Yeah. So I, I go way back. And then I just sent David an email because he was looking for people to help out with moderating. And I sent the email, waited a couple of days and David got back to me and that the rest is history. Hooked every since and everybody, I've made so many good friends and you know, it's such a wonderful community and all my friends have become family. So it's just, it's huge. It's life-changing actually. So <clears throat> that's my story. <laughs> oh, that's great. It really is a community and it took me a while to figure that out. Because uh, when I first started going to conventions, I just didn't understand it. I didn't get it. And um, uh, I think I had for, for, you know, for a number of conventions, I had within myself a kind of a separation of like church and state, mm -hmm. you know, that that I was an actor and you guys were the fans. But I but I still didn't quite get what the draw was. But I was privileged enough to keep doing, to be allowed to do more conventions. And the more I did, I kind of went, oh, that's what it, like I saw, I suddenly 
got the community thing of it. And because the more people I talk to, when I would like, let's say three ladies would show up at my table and I go, okay, well, how do you guys know each other? And one would live in like Nebraska. The other one lives in Hawaii, you know, and another one lives in Maine. I was like, what? And then they, they said, we met at a convention and we became friends and now we go to conventions and we meet at conventions. So I thought, okay, this is kind of like a massive, you know, community based, there's power here, you know what I mean? And uh, to, to, to go to the trouble of maintaining friendships at that level, to go, well, I'm booking my holidays for this time, we're going to go to Chicago and we'll meet you there, we'll book the hotel. And they just got into this kind of routine. And the more I was around that, the, the more all my sort of preconceived, you know, whatever, if you the prejudices or whatever, just just kind of evaporated. And uh, so now when I go, it's I try to make it so that there's that, that there isn't that that sort of uh, divide between church and state. I just talk mm -hmm. to people and talk to fans and. You know, even in a thing like even in a thing like this, where where you, you you know, you'll say you're very kind, but you'll say things like, oh, it's an honor to meet you. And I I just that doesn't sort of live in me like I'm just Gary. I played a character in a part and we're just having a chat. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's it, it's equal. It, it's as equal as anything to me just because I was on the show. It's great. So, yes, I that's what I did. And you guys watch the show. But beyond that. Um, it's as much of an honor for me to meet you guys as, as you say it is to meet me. So we're, we're, it's all the same, you know, oh, nice honorary family members. Honorary Absolutely. family members. It's really nice. <laughs> David's crying. Oh, no, David's, <laughs> David's got something in his eye. <laughs> David's something in his eye. Oh, quick. I better brush my hair again. <laughs> nice. Oh my God. <laughs> Right. So we've we've gone around the room. We've seen everybody and talked to everybody. What else? What else are we? What's what uh? We... What's uh? This is a question for the room. Anyone uh? Jump in. What's your favorite uh, Walter episode? The coffee scene when the stargate is stolen. <laughs> <laughs> that would oh, yeah. always be yeah. And also the scene after where uh, the interrog interrogate like both of you guys. It's yeah. so funny. It's just it's, it's just perfect. It's like you're scared, but you're not scared. But at the same time, you're really scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my favorite is the later seasons when he is more like the radar character from MASH. I think yeah. that is perfectly played in in the SG scene. It, it you did beautifully. It was I laughed almost every time you came on screen in the later seasons because it was just perfect. Well, he's such a great opposite for for O'Neill. O'Neill's yes. like no bunting. Yeah, no, zero sorry. hour. No bunting. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it just won't be the same. Yeah, for me, it was <laughs> Bolton two hundred when first you know um, General Landry's like, "Come on, Walter, you too," and it's just like the instant wardrobe change when you enter the gate room. Yeah. And also when you voice the puppet for the the other bit and you're also you're like Chevron seven also lit up. <laughs> like, I love it. I feel so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, I love that. That, that instant that instant uh costume change was was pretty much, believe it or not, real time. If you can if you can believe it. They How? they did. They wow. did it. Yeah, they did a thing called a camera lock off. They locked the camera off. And they were like, and it was like nobody was touching it. And it was just pointed at once, once it, uh, once it followed me out of the control room and I disappeared, um, about to come out. They just held the camera in place. And thanks to uh, many, many theater productions in my past, where you know, sometimes you're asked to go, you know, you got to go off stage, uh, do a costume change and come back on. And, um, and you got to be back on in 10 seconds. And you, you, you know, you try doing the costume change and you, everybody, every actor is like this. They're like, well, that can't be done. It cannot be done. You know, <laughs> it's going to take way too long. And the director goes, well, you got to make it work. 
And so how you do it is that you you have everybody who's backstage, like the, the stage manager, the assistant stage manager, anybody who's got like a spare pen, set of hands and you slow walk through it. <laughs> and you go, okay, when I come through, okay, I've got to change my shoes and I've got to get these other shoes on. And somebody will literally take your shoe off and then you slip your foot into another shoe that somebody else is holding. It's It's <laughs> literally like that. And that's, uh, and I got so used to doing that. So I knew after numerous theatrical productions that you can't actually say it can't be done because you just got to do it and, uh, and it has to be done. So, so when, uh, when, when we had to shoot this thing uh, of me leaving and coming around, because remember I was in my flight suit, but then mm -hmm. I, when I come around, I'm just like black ops, like I'm just gacked up. Right. So what what that was was you can't really tell because the camera is so far away in the gate room where i am first of all i have no shoes on okay <laughs> i'm underdressed so i've got i've got a a, a t-shirt and a and a black jacket underneath me uh i am completely uh, my flight suit is over the other suit and uh, so I go, oh, sir, I'm not dressed. He goes, oh, come on. I go, oh, okay. And I just walk. And as I, and, and I, and I said to the camera guy, I said, so when I'm leaving and the camera is looking at me, when I'm leaving and I was walking, when am I out of frame? Like, when do I leave the frame? And so I, I took a couple of steps and he goes right there. We can't see you. You're, you've just left the frame. So, so I knew that I had like three steps to take. And as soon as I took those three steps, I just like was unzipping this thing and starting to pull it off, right? So I pulled it off down to my waist and then I went down the stairs, like, like there's like eight steps down to the little hallway. And when I got down there, I had already had this thing pulled down to my waist. They just ripped it down, <laughs> tore it off me. And, uh, and, and as they, as they tore it off me, I held my arms like this and they put the flak jacket on me, stuck a helmet on my head, zipped up the flak jacket. And, and I just <laughs> stepped into a pair of boots without doing them up. And then they handed me a gun and then I just kind of <laughs> jogged around the corner and it was literally like that. That's wow. pretty cool, right? I need to go rewatch that. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stop watch. <laughs> yeah. It was so <laughs> bloody fast. It was so fast. It was unbelievable. And, you know, that's what I was happy about for my part on the show, to be able to bring that to the show so that I wasn't an actor going, oh, I don't know if I could do this. Like I was an actor. I was like a seasoned theater actor. So as soon as they said, well, you're going to have to do this. I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. No problem. And that's what you have to be. You had to be that kind of actor on Stargate to believe, believe it or not. You had to go, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, no, we can do that. That's yeah, not a problem. Gary, are you able to do this? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, we can do it. Let's work it out so that you never showed up with any kind of like, oh, I don't know about that. I don't think I can do that. Like, just like they don't want to hear that. Productions don't want to hear that unless it's like, unless you go, well, I think that's really unsafe. Then everybody's ears prick up, right? But if you just kind of go, oh, I don't think, uh, no, you got to be like the one, you got to be a problem solver and not a problem creator. And so for me to be, I felt pretty proud of the fact that I could change so quickly because of uh, my past experience. And of course, look, look what happens like years later, I'm talking to you, um, <laughs> I'm talking to you, Jeremy, and uh, and you and you and you remembered it. You know, it was something that you remembered, but now you know even more about it, which I love to be able to tell you. It was great. That's incredible. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome, Gary. I know yeah. you got to get moving here in just a couple of minutes, but I would love. You're going to be like, what? Uh, can you please tell me, tell us the story, so we can have it on record on here of when you met Mickey Rooney. Mickey, oh. <laughs> I um, love this story and I've heard it one time and I was like, you know what? I really want this as part of the, a part of the oral history project. Oh, <laughs> Mickey, this was year, this was years ago after you remember the, remember the movie black stallion that uh, Francis Ford Coppola made about the, yeah. the race, the black racehorse on the Island and everything. And uh, they get rescued and they and they come back and, and uh, the horse gets put on a farm 
uh, and Mickey Rooney is like a trainer, you know, and the kid uh, is uh, is the um, becomes the jockey and everything. So Mickey was in that film, and then and then they and then in in Vancouver they made a they made a TV show about it, right? Called the called the Black Stallion, and it was pretty cheesy, you know. It was kind of low budget. And it was, I think it was just a, a, a vehicle for, for Mickey Rooney to pay alimony, you know, cause he had like eight wives or something like that. But having said that he was like a total movie star, you know, he was like legend. And, um, and I got a gig, I got a, I got a day working on the black stallion with, uh, as the horse's vet. Okay. And there's something wrong with the black. That's what Mickey called the horse, the black, something wrong with the black. And they called the vet in. And so there's a little scene between me and Mickey and I show up and I'm like, OK, so what's going on? And he and he just sort of tells me the symptoms of what's up with the horse and he doesn't know what's going on with it. And for me to have a look like you would any kind of vet, like you just say to a vet. Right. Because he was because he didn't know. So I, and then the scene, I'm like, OK, well, first of all, uh, I thought my 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 first thought when I got cast was I need to get a picture of me and Mickey Rooney uh to show my parents because this is this will prove to them that I'm working as an actor. Yep. Because outside of that, <laughs> they're like they they had no clue what I did. Like nothing made anything it nothing made any sense to them. But as soon as I thought, well, Mickey Rooney, they know Mickey Rooney. So if I show them I'm working with him, they'll be like, oh, okay, we well, got what you're doing now. So a buddy of mine was a first AD on that show, Mike Roll, and I'd known Mike forever. So I, I, uh, from doing uh, theater sports and improv and Mike is, was transitioning into becoming a director. So he was working on that show. And I said, Mike, listen, I'm on the show. I'm going to bring a camera. Couldn't, this was before even smartphones, right? I was, I had a little, little camera. I go, I'm going to bring a camera. And you take a picture of me and Mickey Rooney, like on set. And he goes, yeah. Okay, but just so you know, uh, we got to get it before they yell cut because because he he just he'll be gone. I go, what do you mean he's gone? He goes, no, he's really quick. He's really fast. I go, guy's like eighty five. He goes, yeah. Listen, I don't know what to tell you. He's uh, he's got a lot of energy. I'm like, okay. And he also kind of ran the set like he was a bit of a tyrant on the set, like he'd show up late or if they were too late. Mike told me this one story about when if they were if they were um, too late, said they had a problem with lighting or something. Mickey be like, he'd be like, what's wrong with the lighting? And they'd be like, oh, we're just trying to fix it. Mickey. And he goes, no, no, that's it. I'm out of here. They just get in his limousine and just leave and drive and go somewhere. And the lighting would be fixed like five minutes later. And they're like, where's Mick? And they're like, I don't know, he's gone. Then he'd be gone for however long. And then he'd come back an hour later and they'd be like, is it fixed? They're like, yeah, an hour ago. He's like, well, you should have done it quicker or whatever, right? So he kind of ran it. And he also, Mike also told me something funny. He goes, yeah, this is the only show we work on uh, to what we call a Mickey Rooney hour. <laughs> A Mickey Rooney hour. I go, what is that? It was, was not 60 minutes. It's 50 minutes. I go, why? He goes, because the producers figured out that for every hour that we work, Mickey needs 10 minutes to talk about Hollywood. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, so I was getting this kind of picture of, of, uh, of him. Right. And, uh, um, he, uh, so I get on set and I got all my uh, I got all my my lines uh, memorized, and um, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. A mix not on set, and he goes and then suddenly you hear oh mix mix here mix here and and the the energy changes on the set right. Everybody's been just waiting around waiting around waiting around. Suddenly Mickey's coming and I look out and it was shot out uh, just a ways away from Vancouver at a, at a, like a horse stable ranch kind of thing. And I look out and down this long dusty road, there's this tiny little fat guy stuffed into a pair of cowboy boots and he's walking like this <laughs> and people are running behind him, like trying to catch up with him. And I'm like, what the hell? 
So I was like, okay. So he gets on set and, and he's like, all right, all right, let's go. Like he, now he, now that he's here, like now he's running the show. And I'll never forget. He goes, uh, he goes, does somebody have a, who's, who's got a script? Uh, and, I, and I'm like, oh, that's weird. And somebody hands him a script and he goes like this. He goes, he goes, uh, like puts his finger, uh, okay, all right, let's go. And I thought, was that Mickey Rooney learning his lines? <laughs> Was that, did I just witness that? He's like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. All right, let's go, let's go. <laughs> and they and uh, and they go, oh, by the way, uh, uh, Mick, this is uh, Gary. And, uh, and he goes, uh, he goes, ah, hi, Gary. And he's like crazy, he's like massive energy. And I go, hi, hi, Mickey. And he goes, call me Mick, call me Mick. He's just screaming at me. I was like, okay, okay, Mick. And, and again, like any actor, I'm prepared, got my lines, going to be in my scene. The director goes, okay, and action. And Mickey just launches into some speech that is not written, right? It's like, he just starts talking. Ah, oh, Doc, I don't know what's up with the black. It's crazy. I don't know, blah, 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 the, the leg and the this and the, oh, the arching back. And I'm, I'm just looking at him going, what is he talking about? Like, I don't even know what he's talking about. What the hell? And I'm staring at him, and I'm and now I'm like panicked because I'm thinking, are, did I not read my line? What lines are these? And I'm waiting now for Mickey's cue line, and it doesn't come. Like, and he just gets to the end, and he just goes, "So you got to take a look, Doc." <laughs> and he just kind of hangs there, and I'm just staring at him, and I and I like I'm waiting for the cue line. That's not it. Big pause, director goes, cut, problem, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and what do you what do you do? Call out a Hollywood legend? And I go, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> brain fart, brain fart. You know, my my bad. Anyway, so, <laughs> so he goes, uh, they go, okay, going again. And before they go, Mickey looks at me and he goes, Hey, come here, come here. And and I, I'm like, what? And he goes, this is how it's going to go. They're going to yell action. I'm going to start talking. When I stop talking, you talk. And I was like, got it. <laughs> got it. <laughs> so I didn't actually have to wait for a cue line. I just had to wait for Mickey to stop talking. And again, we did the we did the take a couple of times, and each time he just said something different each time, but it didn't matter. He was just like when he learned his lines, like ah, oh yeah, okay. He was just learning the gist of the scene. Mickey could say whatever he wanted, you know. And so we did it a few times and got it. Everything was fine. And then I and then I said to Mike, uh, they're like, cut. Okay, we're done. Great. Um, uh, and I hand Mike the camera and Mickey's gone already. He's like, oh my God. I go, Mike, did you get, did take a picture? He goes, he's gone. I said, like, what? He goes, well, you better catch up to him. Better, better go and run after him. Oh my God. So I'm running after Mickey Rooney and he's already way the hell down the field. And I see him run up into his trailer. Okay. And it was, and, 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 and Jeremy, this is like the version of 200 what i just explained to you <laughs> he goes up into his trailer and five seconds later he comes out com in in a completely different outfit That's and i'm like how did that even happen and he spots me with the camera and he just goes nuts and he starts swearing at me and he's oh, like no. oh my god i mean i can't even really Ooh. say it but he just like, he just rips me like eight new ones because I've got a camera, right? And and I and I just go, okay, man, no, don't worry about it. It's okay. It's not, no problem. Bye. And I'm backing up and he goes, oh, no, come here. Just give it to me. Just get over here. And I'm like, oh, God. It's like I'm already getting PTSD from this like weird little <laughs> celebrity encounter. And he hands the... The, the the camera to like a like a nearby uh production assistant and 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 he's like yeah just get over here take the photo <laughs> and then he just grins and he's got his arm around me 
And I and I'm just like, I've got that like Vietnam thousand yard stare. It's like, what? And then and then the the uh and then the production assistant goes, one more for safety. And he goes, what? And he just goes nuts again, goes <laughs> mental at her. And he's like, oh my God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and we take the other photo and then he gets into his limo and all I can hear is him singing along to the theme tune to Cats <laughs> and just drives off wow. and I was like I think I was traumatized for days you know <laughs> but, but, but strangely enough I will say I will say that in retrospect, you know, I tell that story and, you know, he, he sounds like a crazy man, but I thought in a way I got like the best acting lesson from Mickey Rooney because he, because that's what you do in real life. You don't know what the next, you, you don't know what the person's going to say. So you're just listening. I listened more in that scene better than I've ever listened in any other scene because I was like, what is he saying? When's he going to stop talking? And I had to really concentrate on yeah. what he was saying. Yeah. And uh, and I thought, wow, what a great acting lesson, you know? Because it's like, isn't all acting listening? And it's basically, okay, I'm going to talk. And then when I stop, you talk. People go to, they spend thousands of dollars going to acting classes just to do that, you know? <laughs> Just to be so that they're not thinking ahead or uh, how do I get to the end of the scene? Like, in other words, if I looking back now, when you think about like waiting for the cue line, you can literally zone out in a scene. You can just be like not engaged. But as soon as you hear the cue line, you go, oh, that's my eh, here comes my line, you know, but I had to, but I did. I did. But he wouldn't give me a cue line. So I had to listen to every single line that he said. <laughs> and it was pretty good. Anyway, I have to get going. <laughs> I do have to get going. Well, uh, Gary, I really appreciate you coming on and uh, and sharing this uh, this time with us as we approach our our two hundredth. Um, thank you so much for joining us and and uh, meeting everyone some yeah. some of us again and and sharing sharing stories together. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was lovely to meet all of you. It really was. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a great time and, Thank you. uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Thanks, Thank you sir. so much. Thank and you. David, always a pleasure, my man. Thank Just, you, sir. Uh, whenever I can, you know, jump in and help you achieve your goals, just give me a call. Okay. It means a lot to have you and, uh, and we'll stay in touch. All right. Oh, I'll be at Dragon Con too this year. I, I, I may, I may be in Costa Rica. We'll see. So my, my folks want to do the Panama Canal. So we'll, wow. we'll see. I may, really? I may just do it, but I uh, hope to see you. <laughs> okay, great. Lovely to meet you all. Chevron seven is obviously locked. <laughs> Be well, Gary. All right, gang. Okay. Uh, I'm going to wind uh, things down here. Um, do you guys have any, any thoughts before we close? Wow, show wow. 199. <laughs> right? That's insane. That's great. I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm just used to being on behind the scenes. And in the last two weeks, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to be on the show. And it's just, it's awesome. So thank you, David, for that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes, I really you. appreciate you guys joining. Um, yeah, I, I'm not prepared yet to announce uh, who's going to be on for the 200th episode, but I hope it's it's someone who's indeed special, and 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 we'll we'll see uh, we'll see what comes up from that. So, anything else before we wrap? Just that I've made the best group of friends ever working on Dial the Gate, and yes. I don't see you guys anywhere near often enough in person, and I don't see you anywhere near often enough online. Right. <laughs> And we must get together and have game night soon. Yes, Absolutely. virtually. I, I would love to participate. <laughs> I mean, I want to meet you all in person at some point and uh, be as involved as possible with Dalligate. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I usually am the host of game nights, but with all my surgeries and recovery, I haven't been able to do that lately. But I so happens. miss you guys. 
Yeah, but we're we're gonna do it soon. We'll we'll Excellent. do it in the next month or so. Let's, let's I've, plan it. I've got a good new game we can try. Woohoo! Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, and just kudos to David. I mean, like yeah. I said, I followed you guys for years on Gate World, and now I'm part of this, and it's just it's just an amazing opportunity. So thank you guys so much for that. Well, you guys are great. Like amazing like i know the mod team especially i mean everybody is amazing but i work directly with the the mod team and i can say i am ecstatic about you guys you guys are amazing and when i'm when i can't be here you guys take care of david and i'm i'm just so glad he has all of you not just the month but i'm so glad he has Safety all net. of you yeah yeah absolutely yeah. anthony yes Hello. <laughs> Tracy, <laughs> you guys good? Absolutely. And just thank you. And, you know, thanks to my honorary family members and, you know, take care. And I have to share thank something. Um, uh, we had uh, on Wormhole Extremists, we've been going through and watching um, uh, the rewatch of the show. And I've been looking at a lot of the props that have been appearing on the earlier seasons of uh, the series. And I came across one and I mentioned it to Martin McLean, you know, it would be so cool to have, you know, um, w one of these, you know? Is that the weather? Wait. Oh, wow. That's the touchstone. Yes, it is the touchstone. The weather stone. He yes. went and over the course of about a month, went and fabricated wow. i mean oh, the guys the guys it's the guy's a genius i mean oh my God. details are insane right wow um no wonder the weather's been so wonky lately i know <laughs> i've been messing with it i apologize burn it down in texas for me please it's too hot but i mean he he went and he and he, I, I gave him a look at uh, some of the artwork that I had, uh, and he just went and and created this thing. He designed it for me. It's about one, wow. it's about two thirds scale, one half scale. It's somewhere in there, wow. but yeah. um, you know, it's uh, it's a perfect desk toy for um, the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, for for season four. So. Once, oh, wow. once he's so talented at yes. one point or another that's going to the start so absolutely anything else before i wrap it up with you guys oh um, yeah Thank just you, a quick david. question yeah david um we've all had a chance to 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 say our little bit today um yeah. what what are your highs and lows for from doing dial the game oh Ooh. Jessica Steen having her on and having her get to explain her story about why uh, she felt she wasn't returned to the show. That was pretty extraordinary. That was, I, I look, I look at that episode and that's really why I made the show was to get some of those, those stories out where, you know, every 15 min minutes, someone's coming on to Facebook's Stargate fan club and asking that question. And I wanted to have a definitive answer for people. And I think, I think that there are examples like that really uh, also examples why I've met wonderful people like Martin McLean, who, who make such wonderful gifts that are going to be that the, the whole fandom gets to, you know, witness and experience. Um, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't ask for these things. The, the, the generosity from people who have, I mean, and, and, you know, right there who have such talent, uh, is unfathomable. I think that those are the real highs for me. The lows, uh, it's not specifically about dial the gate. Um, it's just an, ex an experience that I had, uh, with people who were involved with the show that I really didn't th I've been debating whether or not to share this story for a long time. Joel Goldsmith and I had an interesting relationship. We were we were pretty tight there for, you know, around the time that Stargate Continuum was out. And uh, when he died, it really hit me hard because um, for the last uh, few years before, I wasn't really talking with him. And it's, it's a regret of mine that I didn't go back to the... The, to him to talk about his music on Stargate Universe because his music on Stargate Universe, in my opinion, was the best. 
uh, from all of his whole body of work that he did with Stargate. Um, we did two interviews with him uh, while I was on GateWorld, and I was really young at the time. And so I didn't really know the ins and outs of what you're supposed to do, you know, in terms of making sure that information is correct. I just kind of would post it out there and we would do, I would do audio interviews with him and I had him and I had him on twice. The first time I had him on, he wrote me a series of corrections uh, to spelling. A lot of the musical lingo that he used, I was not spelling correctly in the article. And so he wrote me corrections after the fact, after it had been published to to correct my answers or to correct my spelling basically to make sure that it was getting right because he recognized that gate world was kind of an archive for a lot of this i misspelled neil acre's name i spelled acre a-c-r-e like as in like a, a plot of land um and that was that was first i think neil actually wrote me himself the second time we interviewed him i did the same thing again and he and joel called me and he wasn't nasty but it was really clear that I was not doing as good a job as far as he was concerned as I could be. And he wasn't wrong. He was not wrong. And I took it personally. And I never said anything to him about it. But I didn't communicate with him again until the day he died. So never spoke with him again. And I blew an opportunity to get over my ego uh, and communicate with him and tell him how much I loved uh, the the past couple of years of the music that he did. And I regret that every day. You know, not, not every day, but a lot. I regret, I, I frequently to this day, I regret that. I didn't, you know, say, you know what? You're absolutely right. I, you know, even though I'm a 20-year-old kid doing this, I could probably do a little bit better with, you know, making sure, that, at least to come to you before I publish these things, to make sure that I've got all the lingo correct so that people can reference what we're talking about. Um, and it's just, he didn't, he, did, he, he just, he didn't directly express his frustration to me that second time that, that, that we did an interview where he had to, he went out of his way to call me to correct some things, but he was, but it, it, under the surface, it was very much like, okay, you know, yeah, I really shouldn't have to be doing this. And I took it personally and you know, gave him the cold shoulder for the rest of the time that he was working on, on Stargate and through, you know, to the point where Stargate universe was over. And I lost an opportunity to tell him, you know, how I felt and, to, to, to apologize for, for being sloppy and to have him on and discuss what I felt was his best music. And since I've been doing Dial the Gate, I've really been going out of my way to make sure that we get uh, as many folks on as possible to tell their stories because we don't know how long we'll have them around. I mean, Cliff Simon, we lost him, you know, before he could even come on. But I had already interviewed Cliff. And there's some stuff with Cliff that you guys haven't even seen yet. There's a whole, he recorded a whole commentary on Stargate Continuum that I'm looking forward to publishing. I'm just looking for the right place and time. Um, Willie Garson, we, we had him on the show. He's passed now. There are people, you know, the, not everyone's going to hang around forever. And so I say all this to say that if there is someone out there that you're not on solid footing with in terms of a relationship or something that's being left unsaid, don't wait, you know, because you never know how long you're going to have. You're never promised tomorrow. So those are my highs and lows. Well, David, you've done an amazing job highlighting everybody. And you were a kid back then. And I know he. they're looking down going, wow, what a great job, kid. You know, you've grown up and you're highlighting so much of the things and you've grown and you've really you know, that kid's not you anymore. You learn yeah. from that experience. And and I know there are so many grateful people out there that are very appreciative of all your work. Well, I appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm. I appreciate everything that you have done to, to get the show where it is, uh, that yep. we continue to celebrate this, this, this excellent franchise. We have a lot of people still to cover. You know, some people just won't come on. There's nothing that we can do about that. But the ones who, who, who do, I'm thankful to every one of them. And I'm thankful to all of you for sharing this moment with me as we uh, hit our 200th episode in the next uh, little bit. And thank you, Frederick, for giving me the idea. No problem. Yeah, thanks, Fred. I have one question mm. for you, David. Uh-oh. 
can we get a teaser for what's coming for season three? Mean Perhaps season four? some content. Uh, season four? Oh, maybe I don't. I, I I've lost track. Of too many episodes. <laughs> Content? But can we get a teaser or maybe something we made back at GateCon? You know, we oh. made a lot of content there and a lot of it hasn't been seen yet. Yes. Yeah, so we did a whole location series uh, uh, at while we were at GateCon the day after GateCon. Linda, you were there and and Frederick, you were there and there's no place like home. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we went around uh, for a, a couple of days and filmed at the various locations and I'm still trying to figure out the various shooting locations I'm still trying to figure out how to work that into dial the gate uh, I may release them between seasons three and four I don't know when season four is going to start because I'm going to be hopefully filming a feature uh, here in the next few months so I'm taking season three a little bit further into the summer to get some episodes in that I would have normally probably plotted for season four. So I'm talking with people that I was going to put off, but I don't know when we're going to be back. So there's, we're going to go probably till around episode 207, uh, 207, 208, and then I'll probably break. But I'm still planning July guests, and that was not the intent, but we'll, we'll see. And then the Stargate location series with, with Nicole and Evie and Linda – and and then Frederick and Adam, uh, you you guys tagged along as well and did uh, camera for us too. So it was Can't it was quite a couple that. of days. We were exhausted. Oh, it was so yeah. much fun though. Yeah, I, I can't. But wait. I did. I like I like slept for three days straight afterwards. <laughs> no, absolutely. Those of us who weren't who were lucky to avoid COVID and everything else. So yeah, because <laughs> me and my girlfriend got it. So oh man, <laughs> absolutely. Well, guys, um, anything else before we wrap? Oh, thanks right. again thank for you. everything. Thanks again for thank your opportunity. You, Tracy. Thank you. thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Summer. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Fred. Um, Frederick and I have got a lot of work to do. We've been uh, uh, building out, uh, having plans to build out the website. I have a team of people who are uh, working with me uh, right now to make the transcripts uh, for the entire catalog uh, of the show so far, so you can search. You can search specific quotations from the entire Dial the Gate archive. Um, That's great. There, uh, it's it's a it's a, I caught a Susan, Susie, Max, and Claire, and then Tracy is going to be working with me uh, to to build these out. And I'm really excited about about this because you know a lot of these stories are just locked in video and now we're building a searchable text database if you go and check a lot of the several of the closed captions for more of the recent episodes already have the corrected uh text put into them so it's coming along but uh it's it's costly it's uh but it's one of those where it's like it, gotta throw money at this thing to make it happen so the, there's there's AI software that's that's assisting us with the time codes mm -hmm. and and with like the first half of the text, but um, you got to I've got to throw money at it in order to make it happen. So I'm I'm thankful that it's working. So and I'm gonna need a couple of people to to read through the the transcripts uh, just by themselves to make sure that uh, that it's all it all makes sense. So if you're you're in the audience and you want to read the transcripts of some of the interviews, I'm looking for a couple of people to audit them. So reach out to me at dialthegate show at gmail.com if you want to participate in that cuz yeah, we're building can... a drop dropbox of all the transcripts. Let so. me know if you need nice. help. I'm always willing. Appreciate. It. Yeah, I just need highlights of where uh this doesn't make sense so I can go in and correct it. So uh, I want to make sure that they read as well as they sound. Uh, so that people can do the best independently. And we have to straddle the line between what people say and some people repeating words and everything else. So that's what's going on. So thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate you. you all tuning in. Uh, and, and I appreciate you all joining me for this uh, episode. And we'll see who we've got on for uh, 200 in the next few days. So it's all good. All right. Looking forward. All right, guys. See you on the other side, everybody. Bye.